It is one thing to think of the cross and to think of what happened on the cross just on its face and make conclusions about that just by appearance. If you were with the disciples at the time that Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and taken away and, and then he was taken to the Romans under Pilate, flogged to a pulp just short of death, and then he was crucified. And if you were the disciples, you weren't there, but John was. You probably would have heard it from John, how they nailed him to the cross, how he suffered, how he died. If that's all you knew, just by appearance, then you might consider that the cross itself was just an example of yet another victim of Rome. Someone who was uh, an, someone facing the oppression of Rome. Or you might think, ah, this is what happens when you cross the religious leaders. Their envy and their jealousy, they're going to get you somehow. You might think that Jesus was just a victim of, the Rome, of Rome or of the Jews. You might think Jesus was maybe one of those you know, people with a Messiah complex who faced the end that many people did at that time who had a Messiah complex, death. You might have concluded that just by appearances. You might have just said, well, I guess he's not the Messiah we hoped for. And in fact, we have disciples walking on the road to Emmaus thinking this exact thing. We thought he was the Messiah, but I guess we were wrong based on appearances. But thankfully, we don't just have appearances, do we? We have the scriptures. We have Jesus' own words, where Jesus says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a what? Ransom for many, right? So we looked at that last time. Jesus came knowing he was to be the ransom. So we're not just looking at someone who's a victim, but someone who voluntarily gave his life to be our ransom. A ransom for many. So we have Jesus' own words. We also have the Apostle Paul who is very helpful to all of us when we are trying to understand the meaning of the cross. So when we look at the cross, we don't want to just look at the cross based on appearances because that's what the average person does. They consider Jesus as someone who came, had a lot of good teachings, claimed a lot of things about himself, but ultimately faced an end like many people do. Um, there's admiration for him, and yet... There's sympathy for him because he was a victim of injustice. And that's about it. The average person just considers Jesus to be another victim with good intentions, just based on appearances. But let's take a real good look at the cross through what Jesus says and what the Apostle Paul says. And this is what we have right here. In Romans chapter 3, we have, Jesus, we, we have Paul articulating the meaning of the cross. And the meaning of the cross, as Paul understands it, is righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. Did you notice that word appearing a few times in this text in verses 21 to 26? That word righteousness. What is righteousness? When we look at righteousness, we see that word from the Old Testament all the way into Paul's writings in the New. Righteousness, to be really simple about it, is to be rightly oriented with another to be rightly oriented to be rightly related with god to be rightly oriented with one another to be rightly oriented with yourself righteousness is to be in right standing a right relationship it is a relational word to be in right relationship with others especially god so righteousness is what is on paul's mind but he also says this in Romans, in Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, right? No one is righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. So we have a problem. No one is rightly related with God and others. But in, when Paul is writing here, his focus is not just on our righteousness, it's on God's righteousness. God's righteousness. So take a look. Who is righteous? God is. In our text again, it says that God is 
righteous. He is rightly oriented towards others. So he's rightly oriented with himself. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are rightly oriented in mutual love with one another. So God is righteous in himself. God is also righteous when it comes to creation. He orders himself. He orders creation. He is the creator of all things, and he is righteous towards creation. What about towards us? When God is orienting himself towards us, is he righteous towards us? Well, there may be a question about that. If God is rightly oriented towards us, and God being holy and just, then wouldn't it be that if he's rightly oriented towards us, that he would judge us? Wouldn't that be the case? If he is God, and he is just, and he is holy, then doesn't it mean that he was, if he's rightly oriented towards us, then the natural thing to expect is that he would judge us, because we are sinners before him. God being holy must judge sin. So, is God not righteous towards us? Is God unrighteous towards us? Because he hasn't judged us. So this is is the open question now that, that Paul is addressing here. Here's what we have to agree. We first have to agree with this. That it is right, if God is righteous towards us, it is right that he would judge us. Now, this is a hard thing to accept. Because it, first of all, means that you have to place God in his rightful place. That he is the one who is the authority over whether we are righteous or not. He's the one. It's not us. We don't get to determine if I'm good enough, or if I measure up, or if I'm acceptable, or if I can get heaven on my own merits. That's not up to us, is it? It is totally up to God. And so for me to be rightly oriented towards God, I have to say, God, you are God. You have all the authority to determine the outcome and destiny of my life, right? And if that's true, then we have to expect that God would be righteous in judging us. That's a big hurdle to cross. And the biggest hurdle is our own pride. It's our own pride. Like that we would accept that God would be rightful and righteous in judging us. That's a big step. It's a big hurdle. But we have to agree with that. We have to agree in God's judgment of us. So here's the question. Is God unrighteous for not judging us? Verse 25. Look at that. Paul addresses this. In his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Unpunished? Shouldn't God punish? Shouldn't God crush anything or anyone that does evil? If God isn't really punishing, is he therefore unrighteous? That's the question. But Paul does say over and over again, no, wait, God does demonstrate his righteousness, but not in the way you would expect. He does demonstrate his righteousness, not by judging us, but by placing our judgment on Jesus. He places our judgment within himself. He absorbs our judgment. And by doing so, he's able to maintain his righteousness because he is judging our sin. But he does so in a way that he can love us and rightly reorient us back to him. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah, pregnant pauses like that, yes. Amen, amen. This is what he says in verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. So there it is. We are show, he is showing his righteousness. How? By taking the sins that we have committed and placing them on Jesus to be our atonement, our covering, for our sins, and therefore washing our sins away by the shedding of his blood. Yes. 
this is a time I just want to go back there and worship again, right? Because this is why we celebrate the death of Jesus. God doesn't crush us, but he crushes his own son for us. That is what he does to show his righteousness. So again, we have to backtrack. Do I agree with God's judgment of me? Is, am I in agreement that he has the rightful authority to declare me a sinner? Am I good with that? If I'm good with that, then I can accept the next step, which is that God, can I accept God's justification of me because he places my sin upon him, his own son? Those are the two things that we have to accept. First, God's judgment of me as a sinner, that I rightly, if God is just and righteous, I rightly deserve to be sinned. Will I accept his assessment? Number two, if I accept it, then I can accept that what he has done about it by crushing his son instead of me, oh, praise God, then I can be righteous. I can be reoriented back to God, right? So let's illustrate this. There's a wonderful illustration. If we continue to just be at the foot of the cross and look up, then we see Jesus actually doing this on the cross. Turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. There Jesus, if you remember, he is suspended on a cross between two criminals. And in Luke chapter 23, starting with verse 39... One of the criminal, criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Neither of these criminals can save themselves. They're completely powerless. They're completely defenseless. They have no way of saving themselves. They have no one to appeal to. If they wanted to appeal their sentence, there was no one to appeal to. No one cared. No one was there to listen to their story at all. I mean, they can barely breathe. This is us. This is us before God. In our sins, this is us. We are helpless, powerless, unable to save ourselves. We are the criminals. That's us, right? I have to accept that judgment of myself. That is me. That is me before God dead in my sins and my trespasses, without any way of helping myself. Now, one criminal decides that he's going to spend his last moments on this planet by hurling insults at Jesus, by mocking Jesus. And in doing so, he's really betraying himself. He's betraying himself because he's still thinking that he deserves someone to save him. He's still trying to live his life on his own terms. He's not, saying, he's not saying, God, you are righteous to judge me. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, I'm the authority here. Jesus, I want you to save me. See? He's not ready to accept that God is the ultimate authority. But he's angry. And he's trying to manipulate Jesus into saving him. The other criminal, the other criminal takes his last moments on this planet. Again, he's helpless, can't save himself. But he looks to Jesus next to him and says, I'm going to look outside of myself to this one. Because really he has no one else to go to at that point, right? He can't come down off that cross. He can't do anything. He can't appear. He, he, so he says, I'm going to look to you. And in doing so, he's now positioning himself, he's reorienting himself rightly. Remember the question to the criminal, when the other criminal. He says, don't you fear God? Don't you fear God? So there he is on the cross, helpless, 
understanding his situation and understanding that for him to have any hope to be saved, he has to cast himself upon the mercy of his creator. He has to. There's no other option. And so fearing God is him saying, you are the authority, God. You have the rightful place to determine my destiny. That's what we all have to do. That's what we all have to do. And then when he does that, he then goes on to say that anyone, anyone who is going to look at themselves and say, hey, I'm worthier of being saved here, is not assessing themselves rightly. What does he do? He looks at himself and he says, come on. We deserve to be here. We've, we've broken the law. We've been criminals. We deserve, this is just. That's an amazing kind of expression of self-awareness, isn't it? Yeah, we deserve to be here. That's what we have to do as well. Before God, we say, we deserve your judgment. We deserve it. I accept your judgment, and I, we deserve that. But what does he, he can't, he can't reform himself, right? He can't go to a rehab program to try to prove that he's, you know, changed. He can't, he can't do anything. He can't, you know, say, I'm going to give back to society now because I've really, you know, burned a lot of people in my life. And I'm going to try to pay it back and good deeds. He can't do that. He's hanging on a cross. So what's he going to do? How's he going to justify himself? He knows he can't. Jesus knows he can't. Jesus, Jesus knows that this criminal is utterly helpless to save him. I keep saying that again and again because I want us to see that for ourselves. We can't save ourselves, and Jesus knows it. Jesus knows this, this criminal can't show he'll change his ways. So what is it that Jesus wants from him? What is it that Jesus wants from you? Does he want you to kind of show that you mean it? Does he want you to, like, do some things before he says, okay, okay, you're in? No. Truly I tell you, Jesus begins, and just in those words, truly I tell you means I have authority to determine the outcome of your life. I have the authority to say, you're in. You're with me. You're with God. I have that authority. Truly I tell you. He's owning it. And then he says, this criminal's declaration of faith in me is enough. It's enough. Lord, remember me. Jesus, remember me. That's all the criminal has. Jesus, remember me. Everything is completely dependent upon him looking to Jesus. It's what Jesus said to Nicodemus in, in chapter 3 of John, right? That when the Son of Man is lifted up, he's like when Moses lifted up the snake. And everyone looked at the snake, and they were healed. So it is that the Son of Man, when lifted up, if anyone looks to him, they're healed. That's it. Look to Jesus. Remember me, Jesus, is all Jesus wants to hear. That's all he needs. Because in that moment, you're saying, Jesus, you're enough for me. You are enough for me. Appealing to my good works is not going to help. It's not even an option. We are all punished justly getting what our deeds deserve. That's all we've got to offer. That's it. Jesus, remember me. That's all he's got, and that's all he needs. Because Jesus then says, today you will be with me in paradise. That's it. Jesus is saying, when your time on earth is done and you close your eyes, that when you open them, you will be with me in paradise. That's it. That's, that's all Jesus needs from you and from me. It is faith. Faith in Jesus. Right? Sola fide. That was the call of the Reformation. Only faith in Christ alone. That's all you need. So this criminal is justified. He's justified. He's reoriented back with God through Jesus because his faith is enough. His faith in Jesus is enough that he receives Jesus in his righteousness 
and gets reoriented back to God. That's us. So at the cross, just in review, let's review. At the cross, I receive God's judgment of me. I need to accept his assessment of who I am because he is righteous. And being righteous, he is rightly orienting himself to me if he judges me. But he doesn't. And he places my judgment on his son who is my sacrifice and washes my sins away. And now I must receive God's justification of me through Jesus. So if you truly take this to heart, the big leap, I know many of you would intellectually say true and true, both points. I accept what God's judgment is of me, and number two, I receive God's justification of me through Jesus. Check, check. Well, let me ask you this. How do you deal with criticism? When you get criticized in your workplace and people give you some rough performance review, do you get crushed by that? Does that take you out? Does that make you angry? Does that make you defensive? Does that, mm, do you get after it when someone gives you that kind of criticism or denounces you or even stands against you? Maybe if the whole world stood up against you, would you be able to reply, well, if God's justified me, who can condemn me? See, that's the test of it, isn't it? It's the test is, if I've truly received God's justification of me, and God is for me, then I can withstand if the whole world is against me, let alone the people in my workplace or anywhere else in my, in my life, if anyone comes after me, will I be able to stand and say, well, God is for me. God has accepted me. God has declared me righteous. I'm back in orientation with him, and I'm good with him. So if I'm good with him, then I can take this. See, that's the test of it. And how do we, how do we receive this he says it's by faith it's by faith again and again and again what do we see in this text going back to romans chapter 3 again romans chapter 3 when paul talks about this he says just look, we just need to read it again verse 22 this righteousness is given through faith in jesus christ to all who believe there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned to fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Keep going. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Do you see how you do this? You don't just receive Christ and move on. You keep receiving. You keep receiving. Every day you stand before him and you say, God, thank you. Thank you that your righteousness is demonstrated not by crushing me, but by crushing your son for me so that I can be righteous before you. You have affirmed that I am in right standing. I am justified before you and I receive. I receive you. Every day we need to receive Every day we need to receive. So let me ask you this. Are you still trying to justify yourself? I appreciate, Lisa, your words today. Just in the decisions that you're making and in, in choosing to say yes to certain things, whether it's in ministry or whether it's in work, am I doing it for approval? Am I doing it so that I can receive the esteem of other people? Am I doing it so that I can be accepted? Good question. Good question. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Am I doing it so that I can get a whole number of social media followers? Am I doing it so that I can get my peers' approval? 
Or am I trying to get into different sexual encounters so I'll feel like I've arrived? Or do I try to achieve this much money in my bank account? It's got to be this much, and then I'll feel like I've arrived. Is that in front of you? I need to achieve a certain lifestyle. Or I need to, I have career ambitions. If I have these career ambitions and I meet this ambition, I'll be somebody. What's driving you? What's motivating you? In contrast, if you know you've already arrived, (laughs) because you're accepted in Christ, you've been made righteous before God, then how does that affect how you go to work tomorrow? It's not to prove yourself. It's not to try to achieve some level of significance. It's not to try to arrive. You've already arrived. So now what? You can forget about yourself. Blissful forgetfulness. Now I can think about others. Now I can love other people. I can love God. And that's what full reorientation looks like. Full righteousness looks like. A total reorientation where now I'm loving God and I'm loving my neighbor. And you can't do that unless you've been made righteous. Once you've been made righteous, now you can live righteously, because now that you've made a righteous, you don't have to think about yourself anymore. You can think about others. And now the sum of the law and the prophets can actually be expressed in your life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You're free now. You're free. I don't have to be preoccupied with my own arrival. I've already arrived. God said it justified. I'm justified. Now I'm free to love. And when I'm free to love, I'm righteous. Now I'm living righteously. You see? Now the reorientation has fully taken place. But it has to start when you accept, number one, that God's judgment of you as a sinner. Number two, God's justification of you. Do you? And is it affecting the way that you will go to work tomorrow? That's the true test of it. The true test is that you're not not going to work trying to perform and be driven by performance to try to achieve some level of success so that you become somebody. You go to work tomorrow because you already are somebody. And now you can just love, love, love. Good Friday's coming. Easter's coming. Would you let this really take hold? Would you receive? It's received by faith. That's what this means. When Paul says it's received by faith, he's saying it is received by faith until it changes the way that you live so that now you can live that righteous life that Christ came to to die for so that you could live. Will you receive it? I'll close with a few examples um, from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, later in his life, he started writing in, to friends of his about this experience that he's having. And it's not a new experience when it comes to um, just, you know, like powerful moments in God's presence. He talked about these experiences of the gospel itself, like later in his life, in his 50s, about, about my age. He starts talking and writing these letters. He writes a letter to Mrs. Jessup and says, Perhaps the most blessed thing that's ever happened to me is that I now know that my sins are forgiven. How little people know of Christianity who think that the story ends with conversion. He writes to another woman, Mary Van Dusen, and he's reflecting on the gospel, and he says, he says this, quote, I had assented to the doctrine years earlier and would have said I believed it. Then one blessed day, it suddenly became real to me and made what I had previously called belief look absolutely unreal. See, it's taking hold in him. Then he writes to Mary Shelburne in 1958. He says, I'd been a Christian for many years before I really believed in the forgiveness of sins, or more strictly, before my theoretical belief 
became a reality to me. And he writes her again, and, and, and she writes back thinking of this and thinking, oh, some of my struggle is feeling I, like I'm unworthy to be forgiven this way. And he writes back, you surely don't mean feeling that we are not worthy to be forgiven, for of course we aren't. Forgiveness by its nature is for the unworthy. You mean feeling that we are not forgiven. I've known that. I believed theoretically in the divine forgiveness for years before it, before it really came home to me. It is a wonderful moment when it does. Can you say that? Can you say like the psalmist, oh, how blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose, whose transgressions are covered? Psalm 32. Can you say that the way that C.S. Lewis did? Can you move from the intellectual assent about Jesus and what he did on the cross? And can you get that down into your heart where you can go to work tomorrow free? Freed by the righteousness that God has covered you with and given you and reoriented you back to himself through Jesus when he's done for you. Well, this is the time to do it, because as we go to the table of the Lord, this table is for those who are ready to receive. Receive it in the way that C.S. Lewis finally did in his life, which is a wonderful testimony that it's never too late. Never too late. You're never too old. No matter how many times you've heard the gospel, God wants it to be real in your life in ways that can reorient you back into the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Jesus, that you are ever, ever patient with us. We see it in the ways that you dealt with your disciples, how patient you were when they thought they got it and they didn't, and yet you continue to tell them you came to give your life as a ransom. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would do that reorienting work in us to first accept your judgment of us without defense without excuse just to receive it but also to receive your justification to truly receive the righteousness that you have given to us in jesus so that we can be free when we go back to work when we go back to our families to just be free to love not having to prove a thing we pray you do that work in us as we remember you, Jesus, and your death on the cross. In Jesus, your name we pray. Amen. Amen.